I want to draw your attention to Acts chapter 4, verse 13 says, the members, everybody say the members, members. of the council were amazed, everybody say amazed, Amazed. when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, everybody say Peter and John, John. for they could see that they were ordinary men, everybody say ordinary. ordinary, with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Today, I want to talk to us on this thought. Help Wanted is the series. Thought today is ordinary people. Let's bow our heads and let's go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come to you today just grateful for what we have felt in this house today. Truly, your presence is here, Lord. This is a place where you meet your people And so we ask you today, Lord, to lead us and guide us as you've taken us to this point and you've brought us here, Lord, to hear your word. I pray that it would not fall, God, on bad soil, but that every heart would be prepared to receive your word. Anoint every ear to hear, every mind to understand, every heart to hide your word, and ultimately allow for our bodies to fulfill and put action to what we hear. For faith without action is dead. I pray today your blessing upon everyone here. Anoint me as your servant to fulfill the assignment that you have given me. I ask this in the name of Jesus. And everyone says, amen. Amen. Shake your neighbor's hand and tell them ordinary people. Ordinary people. Have you ever known someone that's extra ordinary? Like everything they did just happened to be blessed. It was, it prospered. They've never played the piano, but all of a sudden they get on there and they're going for it like crazy. They've never played baseball, but as soon as they get behind the bat, they hit a home run. It seems like whatever they do, whatever they set themselves to do, they not only do it, they do it well. One person that I can think of off the top of my head is Faith. Faith is an amazing little girl. And this girl all of a sudden just gets this desire to do something, and she does it well. She uh, decided one day to do what Taryn did, and which was to draw. And so she started drawing and painting, and before you knew it, you would see the skill behind what she was doing. She could envision something and put it on paper, and it would just excel. It was just amazing to see what this little girl was doing. And it seems like everything she does, I've heard her sing, she sings amazing. She doesn't know that, but she does. Uh, uh, just her, her, she's smart, she's, she's funny. If you've ever gotten a chance to get her beyond her introvertness, introvertedness, uh, you'll see that she's just super funny, super goofy, super talented. She's an extraordinary girl. Everything that she does is pretty amazing. But have you ever met someone like that? Someone that no matter what they do, they just excel. Maybe you both are doing something and, and you have done something for some time. And then all of a sudden, here's up, here comes your, fi- your friend, your buddy, and they begin to do and repeat what you're doing. And they just do so much better than you. Uh, uh, there are people like that. There are people in this world that just seem to be extra ordinary. Sometimes we look at people and we see what their success looks like and we think, wow, they must be extraordinary. We think of Steve Jobs who created Apple and now Apple is a multi-billion, I think even trillion dollar company. And here we are. How many have iPhones? Amen. Raise your hand if you've got an iPhone. Amen. And so this was from one man when we, 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 we think, wow, he was extraordinary. Or, or we look at people that are handsome or beautiful and we think, wow, there's just something special about them or we think of someone that's extremely intelligent and we think wow that's amazing the the intelligent level that they have and so we become uh uh, we, we we begin to think like there's something beyond special in them but we where we fail to realize is that in all actuality they're just ordinary people ordinary people that have decided to believe in a purpose or a mission and began to work at that and begin to execute one step at a time, one process at a time, one moment at a time, one day at a time. And in that process of executing what they, they felt that was necessary and important, they would fall down, they would mess up, they would fall short. And, and they would, but what they wouldn't do was stay down there. They would dust themselves off, learn from what went wrong, and then begin to move forward. That's, that's, that's what made them successful people. 
I think for too many times we think that there's a special gene or a special touch or whatever on someone and we think, well, that's for them, but I cannot accomplish certain things. But the truth is when we believe in something with all our being and we give it everything that we got, when we go forward, at times we will fail, we will fall short, but because we believe in the cause and we get back up and we go forward, we will accomplish what we set ourselves to do. It's not that they're extraordinary people, they're ordinary people with the mission and with the will and the desire to move forward and accomplish the task that's set before them. Today, I want to talk to us about some men that we read about in the book of Acts specifically. These men were accused of turning their world upside down. Everybody say upside down. Peter. Peter was a fisherman. He was the brother of Andrew. He was a man that was in business possibly with James and John. He was married. He was just an ordinary man going out and doing his nine to five, working so that he can provide for his home. James was the son of Zebedee and the brother of John. He too was a fisherman. And uh, he was part of Jesus' inner circle. And, and so he got to enjoy a lot of special moments with Jesus. But the truth was, he was just an ordinary guy. John, also the brother of James, another fisherman. And uh, he, was, he was an ordinary guy, just another person that, that, that worked, that got the call from Jesus. And Andrew, who happened to be Peter's brother, was also a fisherman. And actually, Andrew, though we don't hear much about him, uh, we know this, that it was because of his desire to follow Jesus that he brought Peter on board to follow Jesus with him. And so we see these four ordinary men, ordinary men uh, that were fishers. Uh, and in Galilee, that was the, the, one of the main jobs out there, one of the main uh, 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 occupations. And so he was just another guy. He was just another dude. He was just another worker, just another employee, just an ordinary guy. These were just ordinary guys. Then we read about Matthew, who was a tax collector. In other words, he worked for the IRS. Do you, does anybody work for the IRS here? Raise your hand if you work for the IRS. Elijah's going to work for the IRS, huh? You raise your hand. I've seen you, buddy. And so, but he was a tax collector. He worked for the Roman IRS. And so he would go out there and collect money. And sometimes it would be shady the way he would do it. But nonetheless, he did it. He was just a tax collector. He worked for the IRS. He was an ordinary guy. And then there was Simon, the called the Canaanite or the zealot. And he was a bit different than the rest of these guys. This guy had a different perspective. He had a different point of view. He was considered a zealot. A Canaanite was considered a nationalist. If you were to put him in America today, he would be wearing a red hat that would say, make America great again. <laughs> that. He's a nationalist. That's what he was. He believed in nas the national identity of Israel. He believed that it was time for Israel to overthrow Rome and, and conquer their land and, and begin to establish the kingdom of Israel. He was a zealot. He was ready to fight. He was a nationalist. He was ready to do whatever it took. But all these men were Galilean men. And Galilean men weren't looked at as someone who was proper or intelligent or that had much to offer. These were some of, uh, and I read in somewhere that said they were the Oklahomians or Oklahomians. Oklahomians, whatever you say. They're from like Oklahoma, and if we were to use today's terms, and I hope no one here is from Oklahoma, all right? But, and if you are, I'm sorry, I owe you, I owe you a taco dinner today. <laughs> but, but, but they were considered some of the least smartest people, the least educated people. They were considered someone that really didn't have much to offer when it came to the academic world. And so these were Galileans. And so when they looked at them, even on the day of Pentecost, they said, aren't these just Galileans? They were recognized by their, by their, by their, by their, um, Speech. There was they, by their accent. Their their accent gave them away. They were simply Galileans. And so the, the day of Pentecost, the, as the people gathered around to see what was going on, they were like, "Aren't these Galileans? Or how do we hear them speaking our languages?" They were like, "These people are some of the dumbest people you can see." But they were just simply ordinary people. But we see that Jesus called different people from different walks of life, and even from some of the least expected areas. Uh, but Jesus calls a fisherman. 
Jesus calls, amen, a tax collector. Jesus calls a zealot, a nationalist. He calls these men. He gathers them together and he forms a team made up of men that come from different walks of life. And these teams were to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. To properly tell the story, we have to, though, now begin in Acts chapter 3. The day of Pentecost had come. Peter got up and he spoke, and he began to preach the gospel message. People are are hearing the message. They say, what shall we do? Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he says, repent. The first thing you got to do, repent. Next thing you got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Next thing he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So the ones that heard and believed that they were baptized that day, and 3,000 were added to the church. And then we find ourselves in Acts chapter 3. And in Acts chapter 3, they're on their way, Peter and John, into the temple, getting ready to pray. And as they're making their way to the prayer room... As they're making their way to, to fulfill the purpose of the plan that God had for them, there was a man that had been lame for, or been crippled from the day he was born. And as he's there sitting at the door because they placed him there, he's asking people for money. And he asked them for money, and Peter and John didn't have any money. So they respond to him, you know what, buddy? Silver and gold I do not have, but what I possess I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And as Peter lifts him up, He stands up and he gains strength in his ankle and he begins to dance and shout and give God praise. And so they walk into the temple and people are amazed and they're wanting to know what happened. And Peter then takes the opportunity to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They get convicted and again, they start believing and they start following. And we find ourselves in Acts chapter 4. In Acts Acts chapter 4, it's an interesting passage because here we see believers coming to God. but We see the religious people getting upset. And so Acts chapter uh, 4 verse 1 says, While Peter and John were speaking to the people because they were now preaching the gospel, the gospel, they were confronted by the priest, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. And these leaders were very disturbed with Peter and John because they were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. What's interesting is the Sadducees were upset because they were preaching that there was resurrection from the dead through Jesus. Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection they believed that all that they were going to enjoy in life happened the here and now and once you're dead you're dead that's it so they were upset that they were preaching this and they arrested them and since it was already evening they put them in jail until the morning they had to spend the night in the jailhouse but many of the people who heard their message believed it so the number of men who believed it now totaled about 5,000 people The next day, the council of all the rulers and the elders and the teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem, Anas, and the high priests were there, and along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all the relatives of the high priest, and they brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? They're asking now Peter and John, who gave you the authority to do this miracle? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, Are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was helped? Let me clearly state to all of you so that all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. The man you crucified, but who God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in scriptures where it says, The stone you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven, which by we must be saved. Here they are, arrested, and now before the court system. They know they're arrested because they preached this message and performed a miracle. And they know that uh, to get away from it, get, get out of this, all they have to say is, you know what, we're sorry. We won't do it again. But what did they do? No, Peter boldly states his position and says, because you crucified him, he would die, but he rose from the dead. And with his name, this man walks. And then verse 13 says, this is where we started. The members of the council were amazed. Everybody say amazed. Amazed. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John. How many of us would have buckled at that point when we know that we might be doing some time? We could lose our lives. We would find ourselves in problems if we spoke up. How many of us would have just said, forget it. I'm not going to say anymore. I'm just going to settle this right here, and I'm going to live my life. I'll be a closet Christian. 
But no, these men were bold, and this amazed the leaders. They saw that they had boldness, and they could see, though, this. They were ordinary men. And that really caught my attention the other day. As I was reading this, it says they were ordinary men. They weren't supermen. They didn't have superpowers. They didn't have a super anointing. They didn't have all this greatness about them. They didn't come from a name. They weren't part of the, the royal club. No, they were ordinary men. But ordinary men amazed men that were considered extraordinary because they saw that they had no special training in the scriptures. And they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. At this point, Scripture already records that there's about 8,000 believers in Jerusalem. Scripture letting us know that these men were already beginning to heal and operate in the ministry that God had given them in Mark chapter 16, verse 16 and 17. They were living out what the, the commandment that Jesus had given them. And they, they, were, they were doing their thing, but they were doing it not as men that had been skilled and trained to, to, to debate. Not, not skilled and trained to perform miracles. They were just simply ordinary men who believed in a cause, who believed in a mission, who believed the instruction of Jesus that said, go out and preach the gospel to every creature. And if they believe, you got to baptize them. And if they don't believe, then they will be condemned. They believed that greater works than these shall you do. He said, he said, he, but they believed everything that Jesus had given them and they went for it despite the opposition. But they were ordinary. They were not extraordinary. They were not anything special. They were fishermen. Peter and John were fishermen. John and his brother James were snobby kids at that. Because they, they their parents owned the business. And here you go, son. You just work it. You just stand there and act like you're working. So here you see this snobby guy and Peter, a crazy worker, crazy fisherman, but bold. Ordinary man, but bold. Ordinary man, but bold. Ready to preach anywhere, anytime. To the point where People were converted by the thousands, but they were simply ordinary men. They possessed no special skill. They had no degree in theology. They, they, they couldn't uh, tell you about textual criticism. They might not even have been able to read. They might have been illiterate. We don't know, and most likely they were because in those times, very few people could actually read. So we, all we know is that these men were not trained in Scripture, and, and these, these priests knew that. They knew that there was no special training. But what, 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 what caused them to look at them a bit different was that they're ordinary men, yet they're seeing extraordinary results. When I read this, it gave me hope to know that maybe we don't possess extraordinary skills. Maybe you and I don't have a degree in theology. Maybe we don't have a master's or a doctorate in any specific field when it comes to church kingdom or church business or whatever. But what I do know is this, that the Bible says that they knew that these men had been with Jesus. I want us to understand today that the way we can impact the world is not by getting another degree. It's not by getting a man going to school for theology though there's nothing wrong with that and I'm doing it but the, the, the thing is that we must continue to walk with Jesus because the only way we're going to make a difference is if we understand our mission if we understand our purpose and we understand it doesn't take a special skill set but it, it takes us to be with Jesus that we can turn this world upside down it takes ordinary people because if we're sitting here waiting for someone extraordinary to do it we will wait here forever. There was only one Jesus. Jesus was different. Jesus was extraordinary. Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. But his disciples were regular men. Regular men that worked for PG&E. Regular men that sold oxygen and CPAPs and ventilators. There were ordinary men that would make wheelchairs. There were ordinary men that would drive trucks. There were ordinary men that would deliver mail. There were ordinary men that would put together and work for the Salvation Army. Oh, no, yes, yes, we have certain skills. 
And sometimes our skills do help us in our call. But we were ordinary men. We're ordinary people. And God isn't looking for us to have this great degree or come from this great line of preachers and, 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 and pastors and evangelists. No, what he's looking for is he's looking for ordinary people. People like you and people like me. You see, none of us, when we first walked in here, thought that, 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 that we would one day be able to do something for God. And the, the sad thing is, is that some of us still think that we're just ordinary people that cannot really do something for God. But I want us to understand today that God uses ordinary people. And it's when ordinary people connect with Jesus that God can begin to use that person to influence and change their world and turn their world upside down. Church, if I, we could get an understanding today that yes, we're ordinary people. Yes, we come from different walks of life. Yes, we face life the same way everyone else does. We're just ordinary. But if we understand that when we connect with Jesus, there's no telling what could happen in our city. There's no telling the impact we could make in Sanger. There's no telling what can happen if you and I recognize that God uses ordinary people. Amen. Ordinary people. These men were not the smartest guys. They were Galileans. Though there is actually some scholarship now that's starting to argue that. They were Galileans, and that's talking about their education level. These men were perceived as people that had no education. Move that forward 2,000 years almost. 2019, here in this place. And I know we're a lot smarter than them. I know we have a lot more technology, technological advances than they, do, they did. I know that there's so much more and we have the access, access to the world in our phones. There's so much more we possess. And if they... They could change their world with the limited resources that they had. Being ordinary people, then what impact could you and I make with what we possess? I'm just ordinary. That's all it takes. God looks for the ordinary person to be willing to do whatever it takes. God looks for the ordinary person to take the mission, to take the purpose to another level. He's not looking for you to speak all kinds of languages like Greek and Hebrew and even re, uh, read Latin so you can read the Vol the. the, the the Vulgate, but, but God is looking for people to understand that all they need is to connect with God, read their Bible, have a passion for the mission, and there's no telling what we can do, but he's looking for ordinary people. Jesus formed a team with ordinary men, not perfect men, not studied men, not men with high positions, ordinary men. And this caused those to see that they were simply ordinary men, but had been with Jesus. It was these men that scripture records that they were filling Jerusalem with the gospel. Here they were, healing a lame man, preaching the gospel, others believing, and everyone amazed because they are ordinary God was able to use them, then why can't God use you? We're advanced. We're accomplished. What can God do through us ordinary people? We have been filled with God's spirit, and there is truly no telling what impact you and I can have on this community. Church, today I have a sign that says, help Wanted. Last week we talked about Jesus having compassion as he looked over the crowd, seeing people like sheep without a shepherd. I wonder, did anyone think about that this week? Did anyone look at the people that you interacted with and say, wow, these people need guidance, these people need God? Did you pray to the Lord of the harvest that he may send forth workers? Because if you did, God's getting ready to do that. The workers that God wants to send is ordinary people like you and me. He wants to use you and me to go out and get the harvest that is waiting for us. 
He's going to use ordinary people. But I have a sign today that says, help wanted. I want you. God wants you. Sanger wants you. Sanger needs you. Help wanted. Will you be a part of what God wants to do in this day that we live in? Will you be a part of what God wants to do through this church and in this community? Will you be a part of being that ordinary person to do an extraordinary work? If today you say, Pastor, I will be that ordinary person that God can use. I want to invite you to this altar today. God is looking for ordinary people. He's looking for the kid that walks in using, drinking, involved in things that aren't right. Says, God says, that's an ordinary kid that I can transform and do a, lot, do a great work in him and through him. God uses people that have broken marriages and God says, I can use these people to help other people. Just ordinary people. God can use people that are struggling financially and God can bless them. And God says, I can use them because they're just ordinary people. But I can do exceptional things in them. I don't know where you're at today. But if you're saying, Pastor, I want to be that ordinary person that God can use. Then I want you to come to this altar right now. Will you be a part of the next phase of this church? Will you be a part where this world, this community is transformed. And it's said that because of their teaching, this, the, because of that church, because of what they're doing, they're ordinary people, but they're filling Sanger with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where are you today? I, I've got a sign that says, help wanted. Will you help? Will you be a part? Will you do your part? Oh, but pastor, I'm just ordinary. Pastor, I don't have much to give. Pastor, I don't have, that's okay. God can use what you have. God uses ordinary people. He uses ordinary people. He uses ordinary people. All these great men of God that we know, these famous preachers that we love to hear, if you ever get a chance to really get to know them, you'll realize that they're just simply ordinary people. They're people that have yielded their lives to the call and to the cause of Christ. And because they've yielded their life and they've been with Jesus, we see extraordinary effects. (laughs) Is there an ordinary person today that says, Lord, use me. Lord, use me. Lord, use me. I've fallen short. I've messed up. That's okay. You're an ordinary person, but God wants to use that. You can heal, you can help, you can lift up. Come on, there's Barnabas in the building. There's a Peter in the building. There's a James and John in the building. There's an Andrew in the building. There's a Matthew in the building. There's a Simon the Zealot in the building. Can I tell you, God uses ordinary people with different backgrounds and different lifestyles. And he comes and he changes you and he transforms you to do a work for the kingdom of God. Will you be used in the name of Jesus?